All right. So we're going to talk about the rest of chapter 15 here today. And it starts out with something very interesting called linkage. Uh, you can also call it linkage analysis here. Listen to me, please. In meiosis, we have so something, or in genetics, we have something called law of segregation. The alleles segregate and the chromosomes assort independently. This is Mendel's fourth law, law of segregation. And Mendel's fifth law, independent assortment of chromosomes. And with the, when this happens, you get all the possible haploids out of the, out of the um, uh, gamete formation. Let me show you an example of that. This female fly has gray body and normal wings. Look on the screen, please. Gray body, normal wings. This <coughs> male fly has black body vestigial wings. So obviously they both have different phenotypes. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. If the genes for body color and wing shape are on completely separate chromosomes, which can happen, you will get children of all four varieties. You will get a child that's like mom, phenotypically. You will get another fly that's like dad, phenotypically. But you'll also get flies that have the body of color of mom, but the wing from dad. You have the, another fly who has the body color of dad, but the wing of mom. Have you ever heard someone say, I have my mom's eyes, but my dad's ears or whatever, you see? If this fly would talk, could talk to you and say, I have my mom's body color, but my dad's wing shape. But this one would tell you, I'm a lot like mom. And this one will tell you, no, I'm a lot like dad, even though we're brothers and sisters. So when the two genes are on separate chromosomes, it's understandable where this gene ends up has nothing to do with where this gene ends up. And at the end, you get all four varieties out of it. I'll give you another example. If you're driving on the highway in your car, and I'm driving in my car, where you turn off to exit has nothing to do with where I'm turning off to exit. Do you agree? You exit exit five, I exit exit three, because we're in two separate cars. This gene ends up in this egg, whereas the B gene, the B plus here, but this one goes here. And so you end up with all the different varieties of eggs because the two genes are in two separate chromosomes. Now, what would, ha what would happen if you're driving in my car, if you were inside my car, if I exit exit three, you're exiting with me. Do you see that? That's called linkage. Obviously linkage would break one of Mendel's laws, independent assortment of chromosomes, and the law of segregation there, right? So it's, it's non-Mendelian. When two genes are inherited together, well, most likely then they're on the same chromosome. If we're exiting together, most likely it's because we're in the same car. So if these two genes happen to be on the same chromosome, most likely they will be inherited together. For example, I'm saying if, I'm not saying this is true. If hair color was linked to the gene with eye color, then you could say every time you're blonde, you have blue eyes, but that's not true. I'm just giving you an example of that. So if you see someone blonde, you don't have to check their eye color. They'll be blue eye color, you see? Because the genes are linked. I am not saying they are. I'm just giving you an example of it. So why is it more common? It's just the, the allelic frequencies and all of that. We're not going to go there. Yeah. So listen carefully, please. When these two genes, when it's a B plus and VG plus, 
if they're linked, they will always go together. So, let's say the B plus is always linked to the VG plus, and the B is always linked to the VG, then you will never have these children. You will never have the mixed ones. You will only get the parents back. So if the two genes are completely linked, you will only get the parent varieties out. You will never get what's called the recombinants. The recombinants are the ones that are half dead, half mom. The only way you get recombinants, or one of the ways to get recombinants, if the genes are in separate chromosomes. But there's another way to get recombinants. It's if the genes are far away from each other, even though they're on the same chromosome. They're far away from each other. If these two genes are on the same chromosome, but yet they're far away from each other, they can still produce the recombinants. So let me show you an example here. Here are the scenarios. Here are the scenarios here. One scenario is on chromosome one versus chromosome five, you have two genes, little a, capital A, little b, capital B. A does something and B does something else. But they're obviously on two separate chromosomes. So when this person produces haploids, the haploid, for example, the egg, remember the egg has to have an A and a B. Which A, which B, I don't care. So we end up with all the different varieties. This A with this B. This A with this B. They're on two separate chromosomes. And then the other variety will be this little A with this capital B. Um, this capital A with the little B. Did I catch everything? Oh. If the two genes are on two separate chromosomes, I'm gonna produce four haploids at this ratio. One fourth of them of this kind, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. We already did this. Every time you do it, pun it square. That's what you do. You say, what are all my varieties for the egg? What are all my varieties for the sperm? And then you produce the Punnett square and the children and all that. So this would be the scenario if you're on two separate chromosomes, independent assortment of chromosomes, law of segregation, all of the, the rules of genetics apply here. No problem, that's not a concern here. The concern is this situation. If the two genes, it's not a concern concern, but it just happens that some of them are like that. If the two genes happen to be right next to each other on the same chromosome, let's say chromosome three here. That's a possibility. So again, this is like you driving in your car, this is me in my car, where you go has nothing to do with where I go. But now we're in the same car. Everywhere I go, you go. So the variety of haploids that are produced from here is going to be capital A, cap, capital A, capital B, and lowercase a, lowercase b. That's it. And it'll be a half, half. 50% of each. So you have to have an A and a B. In this case, one variety will be A, capital A, capital B, the other variety will be lowercase a, um, lowercase b. All right. What if the situation is like this? Hang in there. I knew I, I drew this wrong. Hang on. like that. Because you can't have A and B on the same locus. It's like that. What if the situation is like this? Obviously, what you can tell is in this situation, there's a greater distance between the genes. Am I right? 
they're not on the separate chromosomes. They're on the same chromosome, but there's a bigger distance between them, longer distance between them. What varieties will you get? Well, you're gonna get A and B again, like this one. You're gonna get this one again, like this one. But then something is gonna happen in prophase one of meiosis. Crossover. A crossing over event is gonna happen. And you're gonna end up with this combination. And you're gonna end up with this combination. Now, the ratio that you end up in here, if, it is, if you end up with one fourth of each, it tells you something. It tells you that the distance between these two is they're very far away from each other. Even though they're on the same chromosome, they're very far away from each other. If you end up with one fourth of each, it is equivalent to you having them on two separate chromosomes. There's no difference between this one and this one when it comes to the ratios of the haploids. Okay, there's a third scenario in this here. What if they're on the same chromosome? But they're somewhere in between. They're not linked, linked. See, these are linked genes, completely linked. Now, this one, they're not linked because they're far away, because there's crossover events here, all over the place here. What if they're partially linked? This would be partial linkage. What you're gonna end up with is this. You're gonna end up with capital A, capital B. You're gonna end up with lowercase a, lowercase b. You'll still get a crossover event, but it will not be as often. So you will still get capital A lowercase b, you will still get lowercase a capital B, the recombinants, but they'll be in less ratios. So for example, this might be 40% of this kind, 40% of this kind, that's 80, where these can maybe 10% each. See, these are 25% each. But now, these are more common. The capital A and the capital B, and the lowercase a, lowercase b, they're more common than the recombinants, the ones that are produced by crossovers. So if you look at this here, you realize something, that the kind and the proportion of the kind that I get is a factor of the distance between the genes. Watch this. If they are in separate chromosomes, I will for sure get this all the time. But if they're on the same chromosome, which one I get depends on the distance between the two genes. If the distance is very, very, very small, then there's no chance of a crossover. Then I will only get the parental kind out. The capital A, capital B, and the lowercase a, lowercase b. That's the only thing I'll get out because there's no crossovers happening here. If the distance between them is large, where a crossover event for sure happens, I will get the 25% ratios that's similar to this one. That's why I said, if you get this, you won't know, are you this one or are you this one, unless you do other genetic testing on it. But what if, you're, what if your distance shortens? As the distance shortens, it turns out that you get the parental variety out more than the recombinants. You see that? When the distance shortens, the recombinant ratios decrease. If it keeps shortening, 
this number will keep decreasing, keep shortening to the point where it's really, really near, uh, right next to each other. <laughs> They're gone. The recombinants are gone. So the production of the recombinants is a consequence of the crossover. Well, if the crossover does not happen, then you don't get recombinants, which means linked genes. So I do this sometimes with one of my students. I say, for example, shake my hand, shake my hand, shake my hand. Watch this, we are linked. Everywhere I go, he goes. But now, once we start, we start moving away from each other. Now, when we're, we're, we're out here, um, there's a very good chance every time you see him, you'll see me. See, watch, like this. That's the A and the B, the first one. Every time you see him, you're gonna find me, because we're late. Now as we move away from each other, 90% of the time you see him, you'll see me. Because there's a 10% chance a crossover event happening here, sending me in one direction versus his direction. But 90% of the time, we're together. Watch this, here. I move farther away, there's more chance of crossover. Now it drops to 80% of the time we'll be together, 20% will be away from each other. As I increase my distance, you don't have to hold your arm. As I increase my distance, now you realize, oh, for sure, they'll go away from each other. So it's a factor of distance. Then it gets to a point where there's a set value and it's at 50%. It's at if these guys here produce what's called 50% recombination frequency, they are as equal as them being on two separate chromosomes. Because you'll end up with this. Anything less than 50% recombination frequency, the genes are said to be at least partially linked. Now, none of this will make sense to you until I show you an example. So I'm gonna show you an example on the screen, the one that I was showing you, but now we'll start working with the numbers and what they do with those numbers. So we were looking at the uh, fruit fly. These are real numbers from uh, research, from work that's been done on the fruit fly. Very uh, popular model for genetic uh, testing here for to study genetics and to teach genetics. This female fly had gray body, normal wings. This male one had black body, vestigial wing. They bred them with each other. The prediction is this. Now listen to this now. We're gonna apply the knowledge hopefully that you just understood here. The prediction is this. If the genes are not linked, whether they're on two separate chromosomes or whether they're far away from each other, I don't care about that. As long as they're not linked, they're gonna produce a 25% ratio of each one, each variety. The two parent varieties and the recombinants. So my prediction is this. If B and VG are not linked, I'm gonna get 25% like mom, 25% like dad, 25% half mom, half dad, 25% half dad, half mom, okay? What's the alternate hypothesis? The alternate hypothesis is if they're completely linked, what would I get? If they are completely linked, I will only get the parental variety out. I will only get the parents, the ones like mom and the ones like dad, but I will not get the recombinants. So these are my two hypotheses. But the numbers are the actual data. They take the flies and they literally sit there and count them. How many of these do I get? How many of these do I get? And so forth. Obviously, they're not counting three uh, flies here. They gotta count thousands of them. Statistics, sorry, but uh, genetics is all about statistics. So you're not gonna just count four flies here. You're gonna count thousands of them. And when they do, they find 965 of them look like mom. 944 of them look like dad, 206, half mom, half dad, 185, half dad, half mom. What did we call these guys? 
the recombinants. Okay, what do we do with it? What do we do with it is Morgan, who put all of this together, Thomas Morgan here, he said, wait a minute, I can use these numbers. I can use these numbers, is it, to figure out the distance between the two genes. I mean, this guy is clever. He took the recombinants, the total recombinants, that means he added these two, divided it by the total number of flies that he counted. And he obviously he got a ratio. And he multiplied it by 100, and he got the number 17%. What does that mean? What is that 17%? 17% is the recombination frequency, meaning 17% of the children will not be like dad or mom. That's what it means. And that's a factor of the distance between the two genes. The farther the distance between the two genes are, the greater this number will be. The closer the distance between the two genes are, the lower this number will be. So he figured, wait a minute, 17% of the children are, are recombinant, are not like dad or mom. Can I use this? to figure out the distance between these two genes. Yep. It turns out that it's a one-to-one -one ratio here. We're gonna assume humans in this case, in this example here. 17% recombination frequency figured out this way is the same as 17 map units. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, thank God. 1% recombination frequency is one map unit. Did that make any sense to you? A map unit? What's a map unit? I don't know about map units. If I say you're 17% away from reaching your home, that does not make any sense to you. But if I say you're five minutes away from home, that makes a little bit more sense to you. But it's still like, okay, how far is that? So 17% recombination is the same as 17 map units. Now in humans, one map unit is equal to one million bases. So it's 17 million bases. It does differ between species. But I'm, we're going to go by humans here. It can change from species to species, but we're going to base it on humans in this example. One map unit is equal to 1% frequency. But I just told you, it is also equal to 1 million bases. Another way of saying million bases is centi morgan. Centi morgan. In humans, one centi morgan is equal to one million bases. So, from the calculation of recombination frequency, look what it tells. It does. It gives you the exact distance between the two genes. What it really, really, really does is it helps you arrange genes on the chromosome. Now, you think there's only two genes on the chromosome? No. On chromosome one, we're talking about thousands of genes. The question is, what's the order? You got thousand genes, a thousand genes or so on chromosome one. Okay, what's the arrangement? You're gonna use the recombination frequencies, you're gonna use all of these here to figure out the order of genes on the chrome. I mean, it's amazing. It's called linkage analysis. Again, that's what I did four years of my PhD on. So look what they do. There's a chance that the order of the genes is B, C, V. Or I'm just going to use the first letter. B, C, V. Well, there's another chance that it's B, V, C. Maybe it's C, B, V. All the possible permutations. But you know, there's only one possible... Well, there's one, only one real answer. I'm giving you all the possible permutations. BCV, CVB, C whatever, whatever. But you know there's only one true answer or one true order, and it's this one. How do I figure it out? Recombination frequency. You figure out the recombination frequency between these two. You figure out the recombination frequency between these two and, the, and between these two, and then you map it out. Now, they don't exactly add up 
to 17%, like 9 and 9.5, that's 18.5, right? They don't exactly add up because of double crossovers, maybe triple crossover or whatever. So there's some slight error, but you get the idea. From the numbers, you can arrange the genes on the chromosome. Now, no human can do this. We can gather the data, plug the data into the computer, and the computer figures out all the permutations of those things and tells you, gives you a statistical value of the accuracy of this arrangement. And again, that's what I've done in my research there, to try to map the genes for high blood pressure. So I can talk forever, and you won't get it until you're practicing. Go for it. Practice. I got some nice ones for you.